very good afternoon to one and all. It's good to see the crowd and uh, welcome to the panel session this afternoon on applying and adapting our school principles to digital assets markets. So uh, if I may, with a show of hands, uh, can I ask uh, how many of us here today are crypto asset enthusiasts? You believe in crypto assets and you think that's the way to go? Show of hands, please. All right. Quite a number of you. How about those of us who feel that crypto assets, I was skeptical about crypto assets. You know, we don't really you know, feel that that is the, the way of the future. You're very skeptical about it. Show of hands, please. OK, fewer hands. And how many of us feel that we need more regulation in this uh, market? All right, good. We are, we are in for business. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'll start my speech proper. Very warm well welcome and good afternoon to all of you attending this session. So my name is Tuang Li. I'm the Assistant Managing Director of, the, uh, of Capital Markets at the MAS. I also chair uh, IO School's FinTech Task Force. So today I speak in my capacity uh, as my, uh, of my IO School role. So as the title of this panel suggests, I'll be talking about applying and adapting IO School principles to digital asset markets. Now before that, let me share a little bit of background on digital assets and uh, why IO School is looking into this space. So given where I'm standing right now in this very event, I think many of you in the audience are familiar with digital assets. Uh, this refer to anything of value whose ownership is represented in digital or computerized form through a process called tokenization. You have heard about Project Guardian earlier, so I don't think I need to elaborate. So broadly speaking, digital assets can refer to anything, including real assets like artwork, property. But today our focus is on crypto assets and decentralized finance, or DeFi in short. So a mere one year ago from today, crypto assets peaked at just over 3 trillion US dollars. Uh, but about two-thirds of that value has uh, been digitally erased. And some of us, uh, some of you are already calling it crypto winter. Yes, we have that slide up, up there. So that doesn't mean that uh, crypto assets are a thing of the past. In fact, uh, while it's a good thing that there's uh, some of the speculative froth or fervor has just uh, been taken out of the market, we know from the news that lines between crypto asset ecosystem and the traditional financial ecosystem are starting to blur. A case in point, Bank of New York Mellon has just launched a digital asset custody platform, allowing some of its clients to hold and transfer Bitcoin and Ether. Traditional financial brokers like Robinhood are now allowing customers to also trade crypto assets. So at a global level, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the Financial Stability Board, FSB, are calling for more regulation of this sector. The FSB has recently published on 11 of October two consultations for the international regulation, supervision, and oversight of crypto asset activities and markets from a financial stability perspective. While the FSB is coordinating the financial stability agenda, IOSCO has the mandate to explore investor protection and market integrity issues in financial markets. We also have a systemic objective, which we will channel through the FSB's financial stability agenda. So we work very closely with the FSB. Now, what is the role of ASCO? You may just ask, right, uh, in more detail. I'll, I'll just highlight a little bit. ASCO is a global standard setter for international capital markets. ASCO sets core principles together with supporting recommendations and guidance on how to regulate capital markets activities and the associated risks. So our members adopt these principles, distilling them into detailed regulations domestically. Traditionally, the ambit of these regulatory authorities would extend into securities and derivatives, market, derivatives markets. Our school principles therefore apply also to digital asset markets, but in practice, we have seen many participants acting outside of or non-compliance with regulatory frameworks. So we recognize therefore that additional guidance may be helpful in applying IOSCO principles to crypto assets, in particular, where there are some unique or idiosyncratic features. So in March this year, IOSCO developed a board-level task force with the aim of developing, overseeing, delivering, and implementing IOSCO's regulatory agenda with respect to fintech and crypto assets. The fintech task force is also responsible for coordinating with FSB and other standard setting bodies. Uh, Whereas uh, financial stability implications are limited at this juncture, we saw the, 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 the fall of the asset uh, values uh, without much contagion in uh, the broader financial system. 
but we know uh, observing market practices and the downfall in the prices that significant consumer harm has been caused. So the task force will act on its investor protection and market integrity mandates by delivering on its roadmap, which was published earlier in July this year. So we have established two work streams under this roadmap. The first on crypto and digital assets is led by the UK Financial Conduct Authority, FCA. The second, covering DeFi products and services, is led by the US Securities uh, Exchange Commission, US SEC. My, my work stream leads, Matthew Long and Valerie Schipmanik, will shortly give you further insights as we go into the panel discussion. So we intend to publish the reports, consultation reports, for both work streams in the first half of 2023. So now what, what are we looking at in the reports? Give me, let me give you a few of the risks that are top of mind of the task force and how uh, they, these are conceptually, I was called bread and butter issues and uh, some of the internal questions that we are grappling with. So now we have seen instances of market manipulation, wash trading and insider trading. For instance, a platform employee may be aware of the potential listing of a certain coin and may use the information to invest in the coin or, 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 or together with his friends or family and then make a quick profit. So there are already ex existing ISCO principles apply, that will apply to such uh, practices. So we will provide further guidance on the controls that will be put in place to detect and deter potential abuse of privileged information. We will also provide guidance relating to enforcement and cross-border cooperation among regulators. Another key risk for the crypto and, asset, uh, crypto and digital asset work stream concerns that of conflict of interest. Conflicts of interest are particularly problematic in the context of uh, in the crypto asset markets. Some platforms may perform multiple roles, which we do not see in traditional markets. For example, a platform may operate a market and at the same time conduct proprietary trading on its own account. It is possible that some customers may have their trades being front run by the service provider and they don't realize it. Some platforms may also be invested in certain tokens that they have chosen to list. The platform has an inherent objective or incentive to list tokens that it has invested in, even if the token has been assessed poorly against its own listing criteria. So similar to my last example on insider trading, there are existing IOSCO principles that apply. The challenge is determining the right level of guidance to provide. For example, whether platforms should continue to be able to perform their own proprietary trading and whether, uh, whether we should put a stop to that. Some jurisdictions have already done so. Uh, in addition, whether some pl platforms should be allowed to list tokens where they have active interest in. And if, 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 we, if this is allowed, what are the levels of disclosure that they need to make to uh, users of the platforms? So now moving away from the first work stream, I'll now talk a little bit about the DeFi work stream. Uh, similarly, it is also considering how common DeFi typologies map to the IOSCO principles. A straightforward example would be decentralized exchanges. These exchanges facilitate the trading of crypto assets. Broadly speaking, our school principles for market intermediaries and secondary and other markets may apply. You can see it from the screen. Um, there are also other ISCO principles that apply to borrowing, lending, and aggregation protocols. So the, the DeFi work stream will examine how these principles apply as part of the deliverables in 2023. So before I conclude my remarks, I'd like to point out that despite speaking about many of the risks and of digital assets, the FinTech Task Force, as the name implies, is about FinTech and not just about crypto. So there's a distinction I'd like to draw at this point. We should separate the technology from the use case, right? Distributed ledger technology is here to stay and has many applications as you've seen from panels before this and their potential benefits beyond cryptocurrencies. These benefits may include improving efficiency, faster transaction speed, lower overall costs of operation in capital markets. So we do not dismiss any technology on its own, on itself, but we seek to critically examine the potential benefits as well as the risks so that we can provide the best environment for innovation to take place responsibly through the application of regulatory principles such as the ISCO principles. With that, I thank you. All right, thank you, Lim. Thank you.
All right, I'm not even going to make it to the center of the stage for this next turnaround. Um, please remember to use Slido for the next part of this discussion. Uh, we've got Damien Shanahan, Head of Emerging Regulatory Issues, and his panel. Please help me welcome to the stage. So a warm welcome to everyone. Um, and I speak for all of us in saying that it's really fantastic to be back here in person uh, at the Singapore FinTech Festival uh, for the first time in, in two years. Uh, so my name is Damien Shanahan. I'm Senior Advisor and Head of Emerging Regulatory Issues at the IOSCO Secretariat. And it's my privilege and honor to be moderating this session today, where I'm joined by uh, some esteemed uh, regulatory colleagues uh, who are central to the delivery of our ambitious globe for crypto asset regulation. So first of all, uh, someone who doesn't need much by way of presentation uh, and who's very familiar to all of you, Tuang Li Lim. Uh, Tuang Li, in addition to his exe executive functions at the Singapore MAS, is also the Singapore IOSCO board member. And in that capacity, he is uh, leading uh, as chair of our FinTech task force. Then at the, to my, at the end of the row, I have my uh, very dear colleague, uh, Valerie uh, Stepanek. Valerie is the director of the uh, FinHub at the US uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. And the FinHub is the strategic hub for financial innovation and uh, technology. And in that capacity, uh, Valerie is leading our very important work on DeFi. And then finally, and last and not least, uh, I have Matthew Long uh, to my left. And Matthew is the uh, Director of Payments uh, and Digital Assets at the UK's Financial Conduct Authority uh, in the UK. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, Matthew is leading our very ambitious program of work under the Crypto and Digital Asset Workstream. Uh, but so uh, just. Uh, Moving on beyond the introductions, I mean, obviously, Tuang Li has laid a very rich theme uh, for us to harvest during this conversation through his uh, panel speech. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll leap in uh, immediately to kick things off with uh, both Matthew and, and Valerie. I mean, Matthew, Valerie, I mean, you both know that uh, crypto assets have been an IOSCO corporate priority since 2017. And that was initially triggered by uh, the sort of mis-selling concerns and sharp marketing practices around the issuance of uh, initial coin offerings or ICOs. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, we saw that a lot of that uh, activity was actually fraudulent in practice. Um, and you know, four years on, we um, you know, and it, and it had sort of, and as we, as we know, it, we sort of had echoes of the, the dot-com bubble in the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the IPO space in the early noughties in the traditional financial markets. Um, I mean, since then, there has been exponential growth in the crypto asset sector. Uh, there has been significant positive innovations uh, as well, but we've also seen increasing signs of uh, you know, of malpractices in those markets and consumer harm, and also uh, growing evidence of concerns around market integrity and market functioning. So with one, with a few notable exceptions, not least, you know, our report on global, global stable coins and uh, crypto asset trading venues in 2020, and the more recent publication on DeFi earlier this year, most of IOSCO's work through its policy committees and its former networks have really been focused on supporting the internal needs uh, of the membership, and that by which I mean in helping to identify emerging risks and assess those risks and also uh, assess the impact uh, of those issues from a cross-border perspective. That said, I think Tuan Lee uh, you know, very clearly noted that there's been a recent shift in gears with the establishment of a board policy task force. Uh, and with that in mind, I think the audience and certainly myself would be very interested in delving a bit deeper into the individual work streams that you're, that you're both leading. So Matt, maybe starting with you, could you perhaps 
sort of explain how uh, the CDA work stream is sort of rising to the challenges of, uh, you know, investor protection and market integrity that crystallized during the recent crypto asset winter. And in particular, if you could shed, uh, you know, some light on, on some of the key issues that you're dealing with and focusing on and what we can expect by way of policy outcomes going forward. Uh, thank you, Damien. Um, it's great to be here. And also, it's wonderful to see as many people listening to us today because you'll see as we work through, we're after your help, particularly in the consultation, as we define what we're going to do going forward. We have the RRSCO principles. They are built from other markets. And the approach that we are taking right now is taking those principles, looking at them, and seeing how they apply to crypto and digital assets. Now, what that means in practice is we're going to deconstruct each of them and come up with a report and consultation which gives us some recommendations. So two areas of obvious focus. One, consumer protection. Two, market integrity. But what we've got to do when we uh, look at those two areas is make sure we balance them for innovation and then also competition. Why do we care about that? Well, we care about that because we're seeing some really serious issues right now. We are concerned about money laundering. We are seeing cyber risk between hot and cold transfers. We are seeing loss of assets and we are concerned about theft of keys. And we are seeing some market manipulation, but also it's what we're not seeing. It's the things where the market is being manipulated and we simply don't know. And I'd be really interested for those in this room that put their hand on their heart right now, not on their microphone, uh, and uh, say, I completely understand this market. I know where the manipulations are, and I've got safeguards in place for them. So what we've tried to do is bunch the work into areas that we are going to then work through and present back to, uh, ultimately, the ISGO board. So the first area is obvious. It's a retail harm. Then we're going to look at conflicts of interest and uh, particularly vertical integration. So where traditionally functions might have been done across different legal entities, where they're now being done by one legal entity. Um, particularly the, other, the next area focuses on abusive behaviors. And then finally, uh, not surprisingly, custody. Now we do accept that we're on an accelerated timeline and working really quickly on this. And so coming back to my point earlier, we need your help to define some of those issues we've just described. And we do accept we've got to be agile and, what, and adapt to the issues we see. So in summary, we're looking at those two areas and then we're breaking it down by four areas that could change, but that sounds like a sensible start. So thanks very much, uh, Matthew. So just turning to you now, Val, I mean, in relation to the work that we are uh, doing on DeFi. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, we published a report, a diagnostic report earlier this year on DeFi. I mean, that was a very comprehensive review, you know, of the sector, the, you know, the markets, its participants, the activities, the risks. Um, but tell me what we're actually doing now on the, you know, under the, under the FTF and what we can, again, expect here in terms of the policy outcomes going forward. Thanks, Damien. Let me just say it's, it's great to be here in person. I was here a few years ago, and it's really nice to see everyone so excited about innovation and hear, um, to, to hear from us. Uh, that said, I do work for the SEC. I'm not speaking for the SEC today. I'm just speaking on behalf of myself and, and the work that we're doing in um, IOSCO. Damien is uh, right. He's, he's brought up the, the, the IOSCO DeFi report that came out in March 2022 was really an effort to, to bring um, regulators around the world up to speed on the facts. What, what is going on? Um, how are we seeing things? How do we describe them? Uh, how do they resemble things that we've seen and that we're used to, to seeing? And so it was a bit of a diagnostic, a laying out of facts. Um, it also uh, talked about some of the risks that are present in the market, the way it's operating uh, today, as well as some of the challenges that it presents to regulators. Where do we go from here? What we, what we want to do in, in the DeFi work going forward um, over the next you know, few months uh, before we publish a consultative report is to really study some of, the, some of the prototypical activities that we talked about in the, in the first report. So we talked about decentralized exchanges. We talked about trading, uh, uh, borrowing and lending platforms. We, we talked about um, aggregators. We're going to take some of these major 
um, activities and, and break it down and say, do the IOSCO principles kind of fit here and how do they, how do they cover? And some of our preliminary work has shown that you know, they, they are applicable and we wanna help explain how they do apply and, and provide further guidance if necessary. So we're gonna take a look at that. And one thing that we've learned, um, decentralization, metaverse, web three, these things are, to some extent, they're, they're branding. They're, um, you may choose to call yourself decentralized or you may choose to call yourself you know, Web3, but, but from a regulatory point of view, we're gonna get behind what this label is. We're gonna see what is the activity being performed? What are the services being performed? And do we regulate them? So we have to, we have to kind of pick at it, look, look at it from a functional point of view and say, is this something that is regulated activity or should be? And so with the IOSCO principles, what we have is a framework. We have a framework, um, that are very broad principles about how people who are delivering financial products and services um, should, should behave. We're market conduct regulators. So we, we think about the conduct in terms of how do we provide investor protection? How do we provide market integrity? And so we're gonna look at these functions that are happening um, you know, in so-called DeFi space and say, do our principles apply? So that is one aspect of the work. Now, we also have to recognize that DeFi moves really quickly. And so what we were looking at a year ago is very different than what's happening today. So a second part of our work is to really pick apart some of the emerging trends that we're seeing. We want to take a look at how governance has been playing out in the DeFi space looking at how DAOs um, really are acting, what are they set up for, um, what is the progress being made in these kind of experimental things that are happening. Um, governance tokens, another thing. We wanna look at some of the exploits that have happened and really pick them apart and say, what are these exploits telling us? What are they teaching us? Where are the vulnerabilities that um, may hurt investors or impact market integrity? And then, Data. I mean, I think data is, a, is going to be a big topic of our study over the next few months. We want to see what data is out there. Everyone says blockchain is completely transparent. Well, on-chain data is transparent to a certain degree. It can tell you th certain things, but it can't tell you other things. Um, and, and we want to look at what's happening off-chain as well and see, are there data gaps that we should be concerned about and can we um, address these gaps? And I think in terms of um, monitoring kind of a systemic risk, financial stability kind of um, area, what we want to do is monitor interconnectedness between and among participants in DeFi and then interconnectedness with the more traditional, broader financial system. And why do we want to do that? Really, it's just to monitor um, does there need to be uh, policy making or, or thought around these things? There's a lot of international work going on. Um, not only through IOSCO, but other standard setting bodies and the FSB. And we want to be as helpful as we can to those other um, activities. So I'll just pause there. Thanks very much, uh, Val. So, Tuang Li, just uh, reflecting on those comments from Matthew and, and Valerie, it's, it, it's obviously clear that IOSCO, across both of these work streams, is really looking to develop, deliver on a very ambitious policy agenda between now and the end of next year, which will help hopefully, uh, and no doubt helpfully provide some real clarity to the market and to the IOSCO membership in terms of what we expect uh, around good behavior. But I suppose the, the question I have for you, and perhaps a bit of an elephant in the room, I mean, what are your views on, on the likelihood of achieving sort of convergence of regulations globally? And can we really reach true convergence given some of the obvious differences in the regulatory perimeters between IOSCO members and also perhaps the, you know, the differing definitions of these instruments across different jurisdictions. So over to you, uh, Tong Lee. Thanks, Damien. Uh, thanks for the very difficult question. <laughs> um, well, we'll just say that uh, these are fundamental principles, right? IOSCO uh, sets out a set of uh, fundamental principles for the operation of uh, fair and efficient and transparent uh, markets. So I believe that uh, there will be convergence as we all look to these principles 
and then seek to apply them domestically. It's not very different from security standards today. Our school doesn't prescribe what is the security and doesn't ha prescribe how these are wired into individual jurisdictions. So the principles apply, and we uh, individual jurisdictions will see how to uh, then implement them domestically. So the main thing is to make sure that there is uh, interoperability across markets, that we are able to collaborate, to, uh, uh, to coordinate, and also to enforce. It's the same as uh, what we do to get today in uh, securities markets. There's cross-border enforcement, cross-border cooperation and coordination. And um, of course, uh, there are some nuances within the crypto asset markets that we need to uh, maybe give a bit more guidance. Val talked about uh, decentralized exchanges, about uh, some of the more pe peculiar aspects uh, in, in DeFi. Uh, Matthew talked about hot and cold wallets. So, so some of these are peculiarities that are more unique to uh, crypto asset markets that we can still apply our school principles to. We just need to give a bit more guidance on. So the more, most important thing is we need to ensure that there's no regulatory arbitrage across markets. And there, I believe there will be uh, convergence. And I'll just end with this quote to say that we, our motto is same risk, same regulatory outcome across different markets. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Tuang Lee. So maybe perhaps just rebounding off that and heading back to you, Val. Um, you know, with all this alphabet soup of different names for tokens, and you know, I still remember the utility tokens and ICOs and the hybrid tokens and the securities tokens. I mean, are, and we've now got NFTs and whatnot. I mean, are there any obvious sort of gaps in the international regulatory framework that need to be filled? You know, you bring up a good point with different um, labeling. I think part of our work is really to help regulators reach a common understanding of what's happening, getting behind the labels. So a governance token may resemble an ICO token in many ways. Um, you have to look at the economics behind it, what's happening. And so picking apart um, the economic realities of any particular token offering or protocol is really going to be key to understanding how any particular jurisdiction might apply their, you know, their law. Okay. Thanks very much, Val. So, Matthew, um, I mean, in a, in, a, in a former life, I used to do a lot of uh, policy around uh, broker-dealers and integrated investment banks. And, and we all know that in the traditional financial markets, you know, particularly the big banks integrate you know, lots of different functions in terms of, you know, custody, trading, prop trading, agency trading, OTC trading. In this space, however, I think what we're seeing is sort of significant levels of vertical integration, particularly in the crypto asset trading platforms. We're not just, we not just have all of these, you know, custody arrangements and different sort of roles and capacities in trading, but also effectively bank-like type activities through lending and staking. I mean, how do you think, you know, some of the firms in, in this audience today could go about to effectively mitigate the risks from those, con those conduct and conflict risks? And I suppose my sort of follow-up question to that, I mean, is it actually possible to manage those risks without effectively instituting some form of legal separation between the, uh, or physical separation between the, the functional entities? Yeah, so thanks, Damien. I suppose if you're sitting there and you've got a strong view on this, um, that's why we're about to consult with you and ask you that question, because there are potentially polar views in how people view this, but let's sort of unpack it a little bit. So what we're talking about is where in other markets, traditionally performed functions, custodian, broker, dealer, staking, issuance, um, are in different legal entities. And what we're seeing is this in one entity. Now, I always find it difficult to have a conversation in a room just on my own. So, that's the, so this is the type of thing we're, we're reflecting on. We're reflecting on how do each of these functions work together. So like a good example is where if you've got a custodian who is also, uh, you've got the client asset and their own asset at the same time. If you make decisions that are not clearly traceable, you can then deprive the client of their asset or even worse, they could lose their asset. So what we're asking you is how do we get that right? So coming back to the approach we're taking, there are two IOSCO principles. So principle 31 um, effectively says uh, that's the one for you, that you will have 
a function in place that makes sure this is safely done and there is a safeguarding principle. So I think when we ask in the consultation how you're doing that, you need to tell us because if we can't see a really clear and understand it, then we're, that's we'll report what we see. The second one was for us as the regulators. So principle 35, um, and I'm not trying to throw numbers at you, I'm trying to give you the numbers if you want to go away and have a look at them. Principle 35 a sector effectively says that what we do as regulators will have a way to check that it is fair and that it is equitable rules. So there's one for you and there's one for us. So um, I'll, I'll finish because of time basically on, the, on this. The, the consultation will ask that question give us options on how you see the different functions can work, and then we'll report that in recommendations. If you really feel really strongly about it, then tell us. Thanks very much, Matthew. I mean, just perhaps Val, just uh, rebounding again off that same question. How, how do you think the trading type conflicts can be managed in that space? Yeah, I, it's a really important question because most centralized trading platforms today are offering a suite of services that are ver vertically integrated and as Matthew pointed out, typically in other traditional financial systems, they're separated out. They're separated out for good reasons. It's to mitigate conflicts of interest. So in a lot of these trading platforms, what we're seeing are not only are they managing customer trades, but they're also, they could be issuing a stable coin. They could be investing in an asset that they're also listing. They could be engaging in proprietary trading, which means they are, they're trading on the, their own behalf. They could be acting as an agent for their customer or as a principal. Um, you know, they could be trading uh, off on, on an over-the-counter market that's not transparent to their customer. There are many, many reasons um, where we have a conflict of interest set up from this type of scheme. Now, you can completely trust the people on the centralized trading platform or you can concede that it's human nature to, um, you know, to want to to want to make a profit and to want to profit as much as you can, especially if you're running a business and you're beholden to shareholders or or whomever um, is is profiting from your business. So, because we have these conflicts of interest set up, we want to make sure that they're able to be mitigated and that the customer of the platform is not the last person in line to get the worst price we want to make sure that that customer is getting the equivalent of best execution, which means the best price. You know, we want that platform to be, in a way, acting on the best interest of their customer, not the best interest of themselves. So we have to, you know, as Matthew pointed out, we're going to be doing a consultation. We're going to get input from the industry and say, well, why is it that we can have this structure and still mitigate against those conflicts? Or maybe we can't mitigate against those conflicts. So after seeing what, what people say in the input, doing our own research, we're going to come up with a recommendation. Thanks very much, Val. Um, so switching gears a bit, um, I mean, obviously, Tuang Li, the task force that you're leading is in charge of overseeing the development, delivery, and implementation of a, of a very ambitious regulatory policy agenda. But it's also tasked with coordinating uh, with the relationship with the Financial Stability Board. So could you perhaps explain how the work of the task force fits into the FSB's broader um, financial stability agenda? And I'm just noting that they recently published two consultation papers. Yes, um, so thank you, Damien. So uh, Financial Stability Board, of course, this primary, primary uh, focus and mandate is on financial stability. Right. So in their consultation, they have set up very broad high-level principles on how to uh, guard against uh, financial stability risks uh, arising from the crypto asset markets. So uh, IOSCO has the responsibility to then uh, take a look at the broad-level principles and then again apply through IOSCO fundamentals and principles to see how uh, our uh, how our member jurisdictions can then apply uh, these principles into their domestic uh, circumstances. Um, of course, there's a lot of linkage between us and uh, uh, FSB because uh, a lot of it has to do with how link linked the markets are, how crypto asset markets are linked to traditional financial markets. As I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, the linkage is not quite strong today, but we've got to start thinking about it, right? Uh, how are traditional uh, financial institutions, in, uh, how are they being involved 
in crypto asset markets? What kind of products are they giving to both institutional and retail, retail clients uh, that, that, that link back to the crypto asset markets, but then sometimes it's settled in fiat currency, so the linkage is starting to form. I give the example of uh, Bank of New York Mellon. So, um, so the other standard setting bodies are starting to do the same. BCBS will look at it from the banking angle. CNPMI, I also look at it from an angle where if it, if it becomes a huge uh, settlement uh, system, then what, what does it mean and how do you regulate that? So then it all falls into the financial, financial stability agenda of the FSB. So we coordinate very closely and uh, we've got to start thinking about data. Uh, they'll talk about it. So we've got to look at the data sources from different uh, uh, financial uh, sectors or other uh, uh, parts of the financial sector and how these then form an overall picture for which we can start looking at uh, financial stability risks when they arise. Thanks. I mean, that's very clear. So thanks very much, Twang Lee. I, I've just got an eye on the, on the clock. It's ticking down and the ejector seats are getting ready. So I just wanted to, in the last minute or so, two minutes or so, I'd like to ask each of you, starting with Val, just to give us a sort of a 30 second elevator pitch of where, you know, what's on your worry list? What's the biggest concern you have uh, in this area at the moment? Thanks, Damien. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the, the crypto winter of 2018, and I think a lot of that was a result from fraud or failed uh, projects. I think what we've seen from this latest crypto winter, if you want to call it that, is um, structural vul vulnerabilities that have been revealed. You know, when the, when the tide is high, um, DeFi is a very self-referential type trading environment. That means a lot of the profits are made um, independence on more people getting into it, making, making sure you can sell to, to another person at the next highest price. Um, and when the tide is high and there's a lot of um, you know, froth, people are making money. But when that tide goes away, you have to look at what is the foundation that you're standing on? Are you standing on you know, a very solid steel frame or are you standing on you know, a very rickety uh, you know, toothpick and duct tape kind of structure. And I think part of, part of the importance of the IOSCO work now is to make sure that people understand that those structures have to be strong. If you're building financial rails, even if you're using new materials, those materials have to be strong and they should adhere to a framework that is based on, on clear public policy goals. And I think um, folks who are in this room and at this conference probably share these goals. Um, because they want longevity in what they're building. And so hopefully this work will help bring that about. What I worry about is if people rush into things without um, thinking about the public policy goals that we should all share. And um, so I, I hope that people can think about that as they build the technology. Thanks, Val. Over to you, Matthew. So what I worry about is people. Um, I worry about that there are people all around the world putting their money into crypto, and there's fraud, there's money laundering, and they might not get it back. So what I worry about are those small numbers where it's an entire person's life saving. And I feel it's our job as a team to make sure that that is safe for them, and they're also safe for the market. So what's keeping me up right now is that there are too many holes in the system that we have, and we need to plug them. So we can concentrate on the things that others might want us to concentrate, like growth, like uh, um, uh, open competition. We've got to balance those two things. And at the moment, the pendulum is swung in the wrong direction in certain areas. Thanks very much. And the last word to you, Chair. Right. Uh, what I'll just say is uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the system, how the system is, uh, can continue to be stable, because we, we already said that there's not a lot of contagion today, but we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to keep monitoring, keep observing, keep putting the pieces together so that we can keep the system safe. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's all, folks. Thank you.